Nether Wallop is a small Hampshire village due east of Over Wallop and down the road from Middle Wallop. Within its gentle boundaries, 500 inhabitants have striven to maintain all that is best in the English way of life. And for a thousand years, they succeeded. Cromwell passed through it, Henry V passed by it, and Hitler passed over it. In fact, since Neolithic man, it has remained a peaceful bywater. But all that changed one weekend last summer when the citizens of Nether Wallop staged the first international Nether Wallop Arts Festival. You're looking for trouble? You've come to the right place! I came to Nether Wallop for a quiet weekend! Give a break! Give a break! Hot diggity! Wallop is a jolly place in the summer weather. Part of it is over, part of it is nether. Lord of useless bastards. <laughs> and all the crowds raised up on their bows and were right and waving the shoulders. It was a wonderful program. Would you like me to sign the munchies? Or, 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 or actually, they're more valuable unsigned. I don't know what's going to happen any more than you do. We get that sense? That sense of drivel. <laughs> Hope you're having a good laugh. <laughs> <laughs> You like Margaret? Are you going to vote conservative at the next election? I have to, you see, it's all right for you. Damn animals. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I thank you all very much for being here. It is, to the day, exactly two years since I opened my mail and found in it a note from an old school friend and this now historic cutting from the Sunday Times in which Stephen Pyle criticised the Edinburgh Festival and said, Happy to never wallop. So here we are. Stephen, will you please take us through the programme? The, the reason why this did come about was because at the Edinburgh Festival, uh, there were 2,000 simultaneous events going on, and I went one year and didn't see anything at all, because I was just watch, reading the festival brochure the whole time, and was transfixed with indecision and, and saw nothing, and just idly said, why not have another festival to siphon off some of this art and have it in Nether Wallop, a place I've not visited before, or that I think have had any contact with at all. Um, however, it will teach me not to make jokes. They asked me to organize the best possible arts festival, and I, I obviously haven't got a clue how to do this. My first plan was to try and arrange on the same stage of the village hall, the cream of local stardom, with international mega personalities. But of course, it turned out to be much more difficult than that because while the vicar was available, apart from Evensong at six o'clock, Pavarotti was booked up seven years in advance. Vera Lynn was still at Arnhem, with no sign of ever coming back. And we, we still haven't heard from the Moscow State Ballet. Equally, one told that FC Wallop, uh, an all-conquering football team, which won the Stockbridge Cup last year und undefeated, uh, needed some serious opposition. My first phone call was to Real Madrid, which caused a, uh, uh, caused a lot of confusion because I, I know the Spanish for would you like to play in Nether Wallop, but their answer is still shrouded in mystery. I will never know what they say. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. And I'm sure the whole evening will be as entertaining as Stephen's description of it. Of the people I've asked so far, four have died within a week of receiving the letter and two have gone into early retirement rather than come here. But uh, the, the villagers are having more success with their side of it. They're organizing a full local program and concentrating mainly on thinking up difficult questions to ask me at public meetings. And I know that if Colonel Betty McPhee comes, I, I'm in for trouble. But what attitude do you want us to take? Because if we really enter into this in the spirit of it, Many of these things we have seen before, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Should we uh, do our best to look surprised or pleased? <laughs> or what would you like us to do to cooperate fully? Total surprise at all times. <laughs> uh, a serious talk on primates might be difficult to... to 
to fit in to the programme. What size are the marquee on the Sunday nights? Do we know how many is it going to see? I think it's big What Nether Wallet offers to artists of international calibre is quite simple, really. It offers the chance to perform for no payment whatsoever in cramped, often irritating conditions in front of very small audiences who may or may not be acquainted with your work. And I think people like this. The programme is a bit, isn't quite like Edinburgh's. It, it has got some pretty strange events in it. And there was, there was a sheepdog trial in it at one stage, but we've, we've got rid of that now. Oh, and again, right, lovely. Wonderful. This is partly because it's a, uh, a village festival and partly because none of us have ever done anything like this before. Up to the middle and fall down. Yes, that's good. OK. The programme kicks off on Friday night with an, an hour's bell ringing. It was going to be three hours, but we've got it down to one now. And after that comes a gala opening in the village hall. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. I was all for Herbert von Karajan, the conductor, opening this. But the, the festival committee felt he wasn't sufficiently Wallopian and have plumped for, for Mr. White, who is the local headmaster and deputy mayor of the Test Valley. A breakthrough in the field of international festivals is about to be made this weekend in Netherwallop. Far too long, the towns and cities have dominated the art festival scene. And we are about to show the world that we can be considered a serious challenge. I now have great pleasure in declaring the first international Netherwallop Arts Festival open. She's done. All in the same Sorry. place, Miss Mariah Aitken with more of the late Vicar's poetry. It was gallop, gallop, gallop. It was well a comfort wish when Fraser Thomas Wallop went out to meet the French philosopher. Then he went back to Wallop, and when his wounds were healed, the mazy Wallop River was painted on his shield. It was gallop, gallop, gallop. Oh, fast the horses ran when Thomas hunted foxes from here to Abbott's Anne. <laughs> oh, gallop, gallop, gallop! <laughs> 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 to meet the French. Last night seemed to go very well, but today is a little bit confused. Um, the, the field walk started about half an hour ago uh, up at Danebury, which is an Iron Age fort. This could well be a fault in my programme, uh, because the walk goes on for six hours, and anyone who's on it is going to miss every other event, which is worse than Edinburgh, it, really. Uh, it's odd, having a, a, a field walk at an international arts event, I suppose, but uh, they, they like walking. So, um, many gateways stood here. The first thing they're going to miss is the art exhibition. Uh, in fact, they're missing that right now. Uh, Ralph Steadman has arrived because I saw him here holding a painting of a sausage. But he was going in the wrong direction. He was going to the other hall. Uh, I've also seen Humphrey Ocean, uh, who's here to be our resident war artist for the weekend, and he was going in the right direction. So we're, we've got at least half of them there. Another wallop struck by a thunderbolt and struck so hard that the S has been turned back to front. I wonder when the next strike is going to occur. I think I'm doing male and female voices. 
Well, I, I, no, no, I don't want it like this all the way through, you see, because basically you can't see any of the pictures. You see, and I want people to come along here and then come back. Please, we are about to perform a grand opening. First and foremost, I do want to introduce the official opener, Ralph Steadman. He has published recently a book uh, called Leonardo I. Is that correct? I, Leonardo. In I, French, Leonardo. In French, it's Leonardo I. Ah, uh, in French, then it shows what a perfectly good linguist I am. However, you don't want to listen to me, so I'd like to hand over then to our opener, sir. Well, I produced my own drawing this morning, in case anyone you're wondering. I put it in the, near the catering department here. It's, it's a Hampshire Wiltshire sausage, um, <laughs> and I have actually attempted to draw it in perspective. But, uh, to really completely open this show, I stalked the vicar for half an hour and tried to draw him. So I'd like to just show you that and then... <laughs> And then, uh, and declare the vicar open. <laughs> You'll see a notice to, to the left, Aylward's Way, and you go up there and the field's in front of you. OK? Uh, I've, I've lost the walk. Uh, I don't quite know where they are at the moment. Could be anywhere. Certainly the only thing that they're, they're definitely going to make in this festival is lunch. They did want to come to the book signing session with Gore Vidal and Ned Sherin, but um, I, I haven't found Gore Vidal yet or arranged anywhere to, to have the signing. So they, they can't get there even, even if they do arrive on time. In these bushes here we had a nightingale and we hope it'll come back again. Right, we'll move on. Let this car through, I think. There's only one other problem, really, uh, is that uh, there's a fair bit of congestion in the village square at the moment. There's about ten television vans trying to get in the village hall to re uh, record the late-night review at nine o'clock this evening. And it worries me that Gore Vidal, the trucks and the walk could collide. It could be chaos down there. Do you think if we took down the cornflakes and put them up on there? You know that I, uh, I think mix them in with the cornflakes. I think it's always more effective. So yeah. Think of cornflakes, a book, think of cornflakes. Very effective. We do I'll, this in I'll America arrange, all the time. I'll arrange my own display. Let's we'll share it over here, of course, my rival. <laughs> rival signing. <laughs> well, you could go by the refrigerator. Yes, I, in I'll there, put my, I'll put my a natural own. place for you. With the ice cream. Uh, I would think, or perhaps with the eggs, Ned, don't you? Because I think it's very <laughs> effective to see a book with an egg. I think there's a... Oh, we yeah. could one, <laughs> one gets laid and the other gets reviewed. We'll put it with the Fison's manure. I've always wanted to draw a policeman, and you're the first one. That even though they want you for a bank robbery down in Overwallet, <laughs> now that I had to detain. Very lucky we haven't got a bank there. That's it. There we are. Now that should really bring them in from all sides. Just look at them all. All of the readers, every reader of Nether Wallop is here today. <laughs> <laughs> Over here, in the garden in the 19th century, Thomas Marshall, who uh, leased and owned the cottage then, um, made cricket bats. For W.G. Grace. And no. W.G. Yes, used to come here, didn't yes, he? Yes, he used to come here. And we'll see, when we get on to the mill, we'll see some cricket bat willows. Well, I want you to tell me more about the can festival. I, can you, I, uh, what what yes. can I take you to see? What would you like to do? Would you, are you, would you like a walk? Or would you like... I, I've never actually had a walk. No, I've never had one. How do you do that? Come on, come on it's a very good place we can go. It's nice. There's a ramble going around the whole village. A ramble? Yes. Oh, I, I, we're, we're very fond that's of better than a walk, isn't it? A ra well, a ramble goes on longer and longer. I see. It just never stops. Why is Ned Sheeran upstaging me? I feel that Ned Sheeran, all that laughter you hear on the soundtrack is Ned Sheeran. He's going to be sell them. Nothing That's boring right. with that. Those are my people. Four ninety-five, which is the fifth ninety fifty-six, and all that. That's undercutting Gore a bit. <laughs> you can buy the cutting one. Cutting edge is the same price, though. Actually, this is, this is eight no eight ninety-five. That undercuts him by a pound. <laughs> Absolutely. 
Well, one of your camera crews has just seen the walk, and they're, they're fishing with Sir Michael Horton, apparently, at the mill, which is very nice. And it's, it's good, good news, that, because it means they're, they're on schedule. The bad... Well, I'm sorry that we've lost contact with our weekend in Wallop. We'll be returning to the programme just as soon as we can. Well, we apologise for losing contact with Weekend and Wallop and we'll be returning to the programme just as soon as we can. I'm glad to say that after that hitch, we can now rejoin our friends in our weekend in Wallop. Organ recital later on, which is a pity, really. But if they stay on course, they should make the Tithe Barn where the Fringe Festival is happening. But I'm not, not sure that's really suitable for them. Richard's doing all right. Yeah, he's, he's, he's up at the Tithe Barn. Are you now? going up to the Tithe Barn? Well, I went, Dale, darling. It was too premature. Uh, have they done it? No, they, were, they hadn't arrived, but they'll be there now. We go down here. Everything is under control at the Tithe Barn, incredible though this may seem. Uh, the only real problem we have there is that we've been unable to remove 78 cows from the milking enclosure, but I hope this won't prove a serious obstacle. Norman Lovett! Well, go on, Norman. Thank you very much. My name's Norman Lovett. That's my real name. And I'd like a pound for every time someone said, love it, I bet you do. Because I'd have about six or seven pounds by now. <laughs> that was a heckle. I've never been heckled by a cow before. I'm thrilled. It's a new one for me.
While this concert has been going on, there's been an alarming development. Uh, the, the fringe people have taken it into their heads to hold their own alternative walk, and uh, I've, I've already lost one group of walkers, and I, I shall have to go myself with this one, because I can't afford to lose any more people. OK, we're on the alternative tour of Nether Wallop here now. As we look round here, we arrive now at the magnificent sweep, the completely unspoilt centre of Nether Wallop, this marvellous piazza, almost untouched by the 20th century, is almost exactly the same as it was in Saxon days when it all started. The world of conjuring, uh, I, it gives me great pleasure in introducing uh, the very lovely uh, Jenny Agatha, accompanied by the even lovelier, uh, what is the kind of call? Chapman. Chapman. The, the very lovely uh, Jenny Agatha, accompanied by the even lovelier Karen Guy Chapman, who will mystify you uh, with his slight of character. What are you going to do? Put the Right. I've got two minutes to go. Tabs will open. I'm going to wait. Is that it, Paul? Lovely. Do you want to know what we're doing, Paul? What we're doing, so, like, the first thing he's doing is this, like, television interview, as it were, and I, I introduce Brian. Brian comes on, I do an interview with him, a few minutes. Then I replace the mic in the stand, and we do two poems each. I don't know where the walk is now. They, they could be... I'm sure they're halfway to Andover. They were, they were last seen rounding up a herd of sheep. But I am confident that they will be back in time to see the late-night review short, shortly after tea, so I'm not too worried. Cell is no ordinary battle. In this continuous test, Duracell lasts six times longer than ordinary zinc carbon batteries. Duracell. No ordinary battery looks like it or lasts like it. The CNA Great Sale starts Tuesday. Don't forget, the CNA Great Sale starts Tuesday, 9.30 a.m. Red Cross starts Monday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Close Tuesday. It's 8.13. Right, let's get this road on the show and see what the traffic looks like from the flying eye. Thank you, Graham. Well, things actually looking a bit bleak this morning. A lorry shed its load at the entrance to the Blackwall Tunnel. Euston Rose at a standstill, and there's a two-and-a-half-mile tailback on the elevated section of the M4. Get out of that one if you can. There's a broken down to the traffic. Drivers who know it's tough on the streets. So if you haven't left the town already, forget it.
Hello. Booked your summer holiday yet? I see. Worried about paying surcharges? No need to be. Every Blue Sky summer holiday booked before the 28th of February carries a no surcharge guarantee. Blue Sky. Low, low prices and still holidays without clouds. Just as I stopped to light one of my six mild, smooth-smoking Panama cigars, I saw it. PWP 666. 6,000 pounds for a six-cylinder engine and only six previous owners. So I bought it. And six miles up the A6, as I went to the aid of Sylvia syncopating sex debt, <laughs> it broke down. Panama, the cigar with six appeal. The old iron graveyard is the one place the new Rowenta Tapmaster Iron has no intention of going. That's why it's got extra steam. Just when you need it. That's why it can use water. Straight from the tap. And that's why it's got a see-through water tank so you can tell how full it is. The new Rowenta Tapmaster Iron. Rowenta. Leaves the rest behind. Court sale is now on with special sale time savings. Hurry to pick up a sale bargain in lounge suites and living room furniture. Wardrobes and fitted bedrooms are reduced to clear at sale prices. Carpet prices are cut and there's a free fitting offer too. There's a wide range of big name beds and big sale reductions. With half price offers throughout the store, court sale prices are real eye openers. So hurry to court sale. It's on now. The Variety Night is the last event of the day, thank God. The only minor hitch we have is that the Village Hall only seats 60 people, and uh, there's been a great demand for these seats, as you can imagine. Although there was a great demand until they discovered that the programme's being relayed up to the Five Bells pub, and now I think people are regretting rushing for tickets. <laughs> The rectory over Wallop. No, uh, this is not the inebriate butler. Uh, theatre. T H A T C H E R. Well, don't ask me what the hell I'm doing. I'm going to be so a frightful place in the sticks, uh, introducing some uh, artistic festival. Well, I agree it's very peculiar. <laughs> well, they were hoping to get Mr. Kenneth Livingston, I gather, with a. Uh, Ballet of Afro Asian homosexualists <laughs> dancing round a bonfire, what left of the GLC funds. <laughs> no, Margaret felt I really ought to go and run up the flag and dance stand in, you see. No, I think the locals are taking it pretty terribly, quite frankly. <laughs> yes, I got the impression they weren't entirely expecting a lot of uh, sex crazed cameramen descending on them. <laughs> Treading shit into the Axminster. <laughs> and uh, various randy bearded buggers from the sound department poking poles through the uh, family portraits, not to, <laughs> the, uh, not to mention the wives and daughters. <laughs> well, there's also the, also the electricians, of course. I mean, they have a way of uh, siphoning uh, anything drinkable out of the local cellars with the speed and the accuracy of a high pressure pump. Yes, they didn't like it. No, well, Margaret, as you probably know, not really in favour of the arts, nor am I, comes there. <laughs> However, uh, they do seem to have the right idea down at uh, whatever it's called, uh, Wuthery Nollop. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, they're doing it on very strictly economic lines. Apparently, one of the ideas is they don't pay the artists. <laughs> Buying rather too freely <laughs> with the trout off license. <laughs> oh, yes, of course it will be, yes. 
Okay. Good evening. Uh, welcome to uh, Question Time at the Nether Wallops uh, <laughs> Festival. <laughs> we are privileged to have with us this evening uh, the Minister of the Arts. <laughs> <Lord> <laughs> have any questions from the hall uh, on the question of the arts in general and this flourishing festival in particular uh, I know he will be only too grateful uh, and glad to answer won't you my lord <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, could, could I ask the minister what he proposes to do about the National Theatre I think you probably heard that didn't you <clears throat> what do you intend to do about the <laughs> National Theatre <laughs> they don't get much to eat in the cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, they're not used to answering questions without a scriptwriter. <laughs> well, I think that'd better be all, Lord Gary. Uh, so, if you'd care to just uh, take a uh, uh, bow and uh, say, Come on, old girl, just uh, give us a bow, and I'll tell you what, you come and show us something about you artistic folk, eh? Uh, well, Lord Gary usually kisses me at that moment. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I hope uh, that uh, you've, uh, your curiosity about the arts is satisfied. Thank you, uh, Lord Gary, and a good journey back on the motorway. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it is a exquisite pleasure at this stage in the evening. Uh, to introduce the next entertainment, uh, which I'm sure you're going to enjoy. I shall uh, be uh, down at the uh, uh, bell and jumper, uh, <laughs> enjoying the odd snort. Uh, but you are going to have to sit through uh, the very lovely Jenny Agatha, assisting the even lovelier Reverend Guy Chapman uh, <laughs> to play with his coloured balls. <laughs> Well, hello there. Nice to see you. Now, they said that they wanted a conjurer. So they looked around for the biggest fool they could find, and they found me. <laughs> so I got myself a rig out, and I got myself a name. And there we are. But then, of course, uh, they said that I would need an assistant. And this must be the best trick of the evening, because I want to introduce to you my glamorous assistant, Jenny. <laughs> oh, give me back that rope. Come on, stop fiddling around. Thank you very much. I want to tie this ring. I'm going to put I, that uh... down. Tie this ring on in a very simple knot. If I hold it like that, you can see something important. That is, the string is touching the white side. It does not touch the black side at all. So the string side is the white side, which is the inside, and the black side, which is the outside, is the clear side. So if I could turn the ring inside out so the white side was outside and the black side was inside, then the black side, which is the clear side, would be inside, and the white side, which is the string side, would be outside. <laughs> So the string would be outside and not inside, and therefore the ring would come off the string without undoing the knot. Now, you may think that's a lot of nonsense, but we're very simply do it. We get hold of the ring in the middle, and we just turn it inside out, and off it comes. Ooh. My name's Norman Lovett. 38 next month. They say life starts at 40. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> I live alone in a little flat in London. And that can drive you a bit strange. <laughs> Start talking to yourself. It's a bit awkward if you're cooking a meal and talking to yourself. Can you get me the salt, please, Norman? <laughs> no, I'm doing this. <laughs> You end up cooking two meals. Oh. 
get a bit lonely because I live on my own. One Sunday, I sort of wished I had a wife, really. So I cooked me dinner and put it in the oven and left it there and went out to the pub and came back late on purpose. <laughs> When I got back, I took the dinner out of the oven and threw it over my head. <laughs> I'm a Scorpio. That frightened you, didn't it? <laughs> I've got a pet sardine. Had it for about a year now. Bought some sardines and just took the tin, opened it, and there was just one sardine in there just swimming slowly around. <laughs> Got a bit attached to it. Got some oil and put it in a little bowl and popped him in there. Doesn't do much. <laughs> just nods occasionally. <laughs> To be quite frank with you, I'm fed up with it. <laughs> Thanks very much for listening. Good night. Thank you. Have you you No! 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 No, you can't. 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 No, One more poem, which is, I suppose, a love, love poem, really. It's called, Sometimes It Happens. And sometimes it happens that you are friends, and then you are not friends, and friendship has passed, and whole days are lost, and among them a fountain empties itself. And sometimes it happens that you are loved, and then you are not loved, and love has passed. And whole days are lost, and among them a fountain empties itself into the grass. And sometimes you want to speak to her, and then you do not want to speak, and then the opportunity has passed. Your dreams flare up, they suddenly vanish. And also it happens that there is nowhere to go, and then there is somewhere to go, and then you have bypassed. And the years flare up and are gone, quicker than a minute, so you have nothing. You wonder if these things matter, and as soon as you begin to wonder if these things matter, they begin to cease to matter, and caring is past, and a fountain empties itself into the grass. I, one of my favourite things, those amazing headlines you get occasionally, very famous headlines, things like, um, Star's broken leg hits box office. Remember that? <laughs> and, uh, US general flies back to front. Remember those? <laughs> and a fa particular favourite of mine was, I think, when the Washington were trying to help out the GIs in, uh, Vietnam, I think, and there was a headline which said, US flies in hamburgers. And this is the point. <laughs> 
US flies in hamburgers. <laughs> if you go down the high street today, you'll be sure of a big surprise when you order your favorite burger with a milkshake and regular fries. For the secret is out, I tell you no lies, they've stopped using beef in favor of flies. Flies, flies, big juicy flies, flies as Americans, apple pies. Horse flies from Texas, as big as your thumb, are sorted with onions and served in a bun. Free range blue bottles, carefully rinsed, are smothered in garlic and painlessly minced. Black eyed bees with stings intact at a zesty zing, and that's a fact. Colorado beetles, ants from Kentucky, road island roaches, and if you're unlucky, Baltimore bedbugs and even horrider, leeches as squashy as peaches from Florida. <laughs> flies, flies, big juicy flies, flies as American as mum's apple pies. It's lovely down in McDonald's today, but if you don't fancy flies, better I'd say to see, keep well away, stay home and eat bird's eyes. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> Good evening, my name's Kevin Turvey. Yeah. And before we start, I'd just like to say uh, that I can't tell you what a great pleasure it is to be appearing in the nether regions again. <laughs> now, I can't tell you because I'm in a bit of a bad mood at the moment. <sighs> Don't ask me why. Just a strange and interesting person, I suppose. <laughs> a bit like Anita Harris. <laughs> And, you know, without the bullet hole, you know. <laughs> but I've been in a bad mood all day. All day! Well, uh, not absolutely all day. You know, I mean, I was asleep for a bit of the day. It was the beginning bit of the day that I was asleep for. But I was in a bad mood when I woke up. I woke up, right? I got out of the bath. <laughs> Wiped all the sick off my legs, you know. <laughs> Now you have to, you know. I thought I'd better have a bit of breakfast, right? Because my stomach was completely empty. <laughs> well, I mean, there was an intestine in there. And, and... So I thought, I'll get out to the kitchen, right? So I got into the kitchen, I thought, what shall I have for my breakfast? I know, I'll have bacon crisps, right? <laughs> well, I'm not going to have prawn cocktail flavour for breakfast, am I? <laughs> anyway, I got out the crisps and I started to open them. Finished opening them, started to eat them, right? Well, you got to start somewhere, haven't you? You know. <laughs> I started with the top one. You know. <laughs> well, it's better than starting with the bottom one, you know, because start with the bottom one, you've got to get all the other crisps out first. You know. <laughs> and by the time you've eaten it, you can't remember what order to put them all back in again. <laughs> Not bad unless you mark them with a the biro or something. Like that. <laughs> then the taste all inky, they make you sick again. You got all the back business. You know. Start with the top one. That's my tip. <laughs> That's what I did. I started with the top one. You know. Working my way through, crisp by crisp. You know, sometimes a double. <laughs> I just had a few crisps, right? I just had a few. I don't know how many. It was ten crisps about. Anyway, it's not important. I just had a few, right? And the telephone went. Just got up and buggered off like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I ran and I picked it up, you know. I answered it. It was the bloke who runs this place. Yeah. Colonel Wallop, it was him. <laughs> he says, Kevin Turvey. I said, yes. Well, he was right, you know. <laughs> just Kevin says, where are you? I said, I'm at home. Where do you think? He says, we're just supposed to be in the nether regions. He <laughs> <laughs> says, did that even stop being funny or you mean serious trouble, Turvey? <laughs> so here I am. That's why I'm late. I'm sorry I'm late. But here's my joke. <laughs> no, that's not it, I just moved the mic a bit there. Here's my joke. Now then, what do you say to a black that's got no arms and no legs if your watch is broken? <laughs> <laughs> Have you got the time on you, cock? <laughs>
the taste of Tenants Extra. Everything is reduced in the great Comet January sale. It's now on and we're open tomorrow and New Year's Day, so don't miss it. You could win £100,000 in the new Reader's Digest prize draw. Watch your post for this envelope. And if you're lucky enough to get one, you'll have six chances to win. Open and return the six free entries right away. And this £100,000 check could be yours. When Richard Henschel and his partners set up Payfec in Nottingham to write computer software for engineers, we helped program the company's growth. Last summer alone, 50 graduates were taken on, and Richard and his colleagues have plans to employ even more. We loaned Bert Bridgman money for vital factory space, helping create 60 new openings at his Bedfordshire fire door manufacturing firm. While in Wales, we've worked with the Thomas family on a recipe for success. With our financial help, their business, Peter's Savoury Products, has doubled its workforce to 700 in just two years. In fact, over the last year, by putting money to work, we have actively helped create thousands of new jobs. Nat West, the Action Bank. Every year, the Schmitz, the Mullers and the Reinhardts drive to their holiday villas. The Schmidt's car is slow and rather noisy, so when they arrive, they'll need another holiday to get over this one. The Mullers drive a big, thirsty car, which is probably at a petrol station somewhere between Munich and Marbella. The Reinhardts drive an Audi 100, a car so aerodynamic that it's capable of 125 miles per hour. Yet, at a steady 56, it slips along quietly for over 750 miles on one tank full of petrol. And the moral of the story is, if you want to get on the beach before the Germans, you better buy an Audi 100. Vorsprung durch Technik, as they say in Germany. Don Jose Ignacio Domecq. A man above all others with a nose for fine sherry. Creator of the famous Domecq Double Century. A range of five superb sherries to suit every taste. Domecq Double Century, the true taste of sherry. Are you still buying a tube ticket every day? There is a cheaper way to get to work. Get a travel card and stop throwing money down the tube. Yes, the walk did finish. Uh, some of them are now in the pageant, which is more walking, but with actions. Uh, Trevor Nunn directed this pageant, but unfortunately, it has to start at 9.30 in the morning uh, to fit into the programme. I, I don't think he's going to be able to get here. But if they don't move off quite sharpish, we're going to have a clash with the quiz, uh, the Harvest Festival and the Brigadier's Lunch, which could be difficult. And come and see perform the pageant of Nether Wallop. Are we not following the town crier? Is he not with us? He seems to be in the rear. Later Saxon times, local tradition says that Nether Wallop was the birthplace of Lady Godiva. She rode the streets of Wallop fully clothed. Earl Godwin was her pater, King Harold was her bro, and Fife Head House her home until it was time for her to go. This is another rather unusual event for an international arts festival. They hold a lot of quizzes in Nether Wallop, so I thought, why don't we pit our team 
against the world's greatest minds, and this is Nether Wallop versus the world's greatest philosophers, chaired by Bamber Gascoigne, who is used to dealing with great intellects. Of the two, the philosophers seem rather more awed by the prospect than the villagers. Good, well, welcome everybody to this great yeah. quiz in the Nether Wallop Festival between one of the greatest teams of minds ever gathered together, I would say, for such a festival. On my left, the greatest philosophers in the world, they are builders. What does it actually say? The world's great philosophers, there you are. And bravely lining up against them, the team from Nether Wallace. So let's first of all meet some of the world's greatest minds. The captain of them is Sir Freddie Eyre, sitting in the one from the side there, in the middle of the three of them. AJ Eyre, the former. <laughs> former Wickham Professor of Logic at Oxford. Sitting on his right here is Arnold Zuboff who is the lecturer in philosophy at University College London. <laughs> and sitting on his left is Jerry, Jerry Cohen, who is next year about to become the Chichley Professor of Social and Political Theory at Oxford. <laughs> and now batting for uh, Nether Wallop, we have some more of the great minds of the world, certainly the great minds of Nether Wallop. We have their captain, Fred Moland, who is sitting on the right of them there, who I don't need to tell you all is chairman of the parish council and the local undertaker. <laughs> And we have sitting beside him the leading nether wallop expert on aerobics. She doesn't like that description, but I'm told by some that she is that. It's Larry Mitchell. Applause for her. <laughs> and on the left wing, Richard Osmond, the farmer of Broadgate Farm, which has been in his family, he tells me, since 1600. Richard Osmond. <laughs> now we begin with a bell, we end with a gong, so let's go straight into our first round. And with 12 questions in that, and let's have the bell. We're off. What is a duck rabbit? Is Freddie Air got in there first? It's a puzzle picture which can be read either as a duck or, or a rabbit, and it was introduced into philosophy by Ludwig Wittgenstein in the investigation. <laughs> <laughs> the farmers thought they must have had it made with a duck rabbit, but that indeed is what a duck rabbit is. So it's 10 points there to the philosophers. Right. And a second question. Why did Hume disbelieve in miracles? Freddie's got in there again he thought first. It was contrary to the laws of nature. That is correct. You can't hold a good man down. He's always wanted to get in, into a quiz game, and at last he's made it. All right, another question. What do Igri and Maris Otter have in common? Yes, Richard. Winter barley. They are both varieties of winter barley. Yeah. And <laughs> Nether Wallop come back strongly with 10 points, 20 to 10. Now, it's still a bit running one way, this at the moment, but don't despair on the other side. Which Greek Stoic philosopher spent all his time naked in a barrel to show he didn't need anything to be happy? Uh, and Di yes. Diogenes the liar. Diogenes, uh, no, Diogenes Laertius. Yes, absolutely right. And that, that Jerry comes in there with his first 10 points for Diogenes. Correct, 10 points there. Now I want to know who dug a pond in her garden? Made her own paddle steamer and went round and round on it. Yes, Miss Larry. McPhee. What's her type? Normal. What's her rank? Colonel McPhee. Colonel. And what's her Christian name? Betty. Colonel Betty McPhee. We well, got that. <laughs> Colonel Betty McPhee. All right. Now back a bit to the other side. This looks like. What is Kant's name for that which he claims to be the unconditional moral law for all? Right. Yes, Arnold. Categorical imperative. Categorical imperative. Yeah. Another ten points to them. They're establishing a big lead, but there's lots of time. Who went to a cocktail party in Bent Street? Street, dressed as a witch and went ah, ah, ah at all the guests. Yes, sir, Larry. Colonel McPhee. Colonel Betty McPhee <laughs> did indeed. Another ten points there to another wallop. And finally, the last one in this first round, I want to know which philosopher scheduled his lectures for the same time as Hegel's because he hated him and didn't want to have him to have an audience. Yes, it was uh, Fred Egan. Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer is correct. And the score at the end of this first uh, round is 90 to the philosophers, who are, after all, the greatest minds in the world, and 30 to another wallet for 33% as good as the greatest minds in the world already. <laughs> another fight. Another battle. <laughs> we got up the firearms now. In the Trout Off Licence, an ancient alehouse, now uh, beautifully renovated, in a shed in its front garden, Thomas Marshall made his bats from Wallop Willow, which the famous W.G. Grace used. Hey! Oh. Ah! The other 16th century cottages remember when the square was a village green where the stock stood for the punishment of wrongdoers.
Now, another question I want to know. What new vaccine kills all ten strains of foot rot in sheep? Anyone there? Not Clovax. Uh, no, not Clovax. Anyone in the back of the mind? Uh... Foot Vax. Foot Vax, he got there. Ten points. Foot Vax, he got there. And there's only one to go now before they're neck and neck again at 90 all. I want to know, what is the general name? for a philosophical theory in which there is only one ultimate reality, whether spirit, matter, or neutral substance. Anyone get that very... Yes, uh, Fred. Um, moneyism. Mon well, a bit like monism. <laughs> <laughs> sounds, sounds a bit more of Margaret Thatcher in than uh, we'd intended, but... <laughs> Let's reduce moneyism to monism and give them the ten points neck and neck and... What a magnificent display there by another wallow. And what can the philosophers do confronted with brilliance such as that? So they've got six questions all of their own. Let's see how they can do. What is the gestation period of a cow? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Arnold. It's nine months, one week. Nine months, one week, absolutely to the day. Right, now for ten points again, I want to know who put on a false beard pretended to be an Austrian bird expert and addressed the Women's Institute for 20 minutes before they discovered who it was. Can anyone work Can colour? only have happened here, and therefore it must be Colonel Betty McPhee. <laughs> Colonel Betty McPhee! Absolutely right, Colonel Betty McPhee. 1982. The vicar's wife enters the London Marathon and triumphantly finishes the course to the greater glory of Wallop. September the 30th, 1984. Nether Wallop holds a festival to raise funds for the repair of the church. God bless Nether Wallop. God bless Over Wallop. God, God bless, bless us, us all. all. <laughs> then that has brought them up to only 10 points behind. And I want to know, what do the following have in common? Hampshire Down, Oxford Down, and Dorset Down. Anyone on that one? Oh, shoot, nothing from the... I'm going to, to... Oh, I'm going to have to throw that out, I'm afraid, prompting from the audience. Yes. You lost another well of a valuable ten points by prompting from the audience. So, I know, but I'm very... I'm known to be a strict question mark. And now we'll have another one. Who in Nether Wallop was buried in an armchair in bright yellow trousers inside a pyramid? Yes, Fred. Dr. Deuce. Dr. Deuce, 10 points, and they're in the lead for the first time at 200, 290. And another question. Who proposed to say to whom, why have you made the evidence for yourself so insufficient? Freddie got there again first, undoubtedly. Bertrand Russell to God. Now, we've got a clergyman at the back, he won't accept that. <laughs> And neck and neck again at 230, all we've got less than a minute to go now. And I want to know, for what is Professor Tristram most famous? I'm sure the floor... Yes, someone on that side knows about it. When the paintings were discovered in 1929, he was the professor who was in charge of... He uh, was the professor in charge of discovering paintings in 1929, and we will not reveal where the paintings were. It happens they were another one. the end of the Nether Wallet Quiz. we have a number of children in church and it's only right that they should have their spot and for this purpose I have brought along a box of apples here and any children anybody else for that matter can see these are very nice apples now I also have four other apples here and uh, I wonder what children would think of these ones here we have some rather Yes, disgusting apples, completely bad, fungus growing on them, and really rather a smell. 
In fact, I'd better put a lid on fairly soon. Now, I have... I think I'll put the lid on now. <laughs> I have a simple question to ask, and that is, which is easier, to turn good apples into bad apples, or to turn bad apples into good apples? What about that? <laughs> Thank you. I did think you were going to do a magic trick there. <laughs> With the apples, I thought, oh my goodness. <laughs> Only three things to go now. Uh, I do know that people are turning up to rehearse for Variety Night uh, this evening. I'm going to be a wave. We're looking forward to it. I need a lot to drink if I'm going to be a wave. Then there's the Brownies Ballet at the same time as the football match. I'm, I'm not at all sure who's in the football match. I don't, when Real Madrid couldn't come, I asked Liverpool, but they had a, a European Cup tie in Poland. So I said Netherwallop's on the way to Poland, but they, they were still uh, unable to make it. We seem to have two referees out there, Simon Stainrod and Gary O'Reilly, but I don't suppose for one minute they know what the score is. I know, you notice it's an old nether Wallopian custom. You'll, you'll observe that both teams, are, one team is dressed as women and the other team dressed as, uh, as, as flashers, which is uh, an old Benny Hill script they're working from. <laughs> Does that beat a long distance telephoto <laughs> of that? <laughs> Focus through them. One, two, through four, and Fido. Harry Tesco's dangling microphone. <laughs> Please ask someone to come and take my place. Embarrass me, look it full in the bloody eyeball of that camera. Fork us through. Oh, yes. Yeah. Is you old? And deep joy to you, too. Yeah. <laughs> Hope you enjoy the meal. Pardon, I'll suckle down that, if you're old. Because uh, we're all here for that. You know, I'll just, people line up knife and forky in the custophobia <laughs> there and stuffle them. Fork us through and suicide commit by now. I'm falling with an American doctor who said we'd make Ross on the growl. Oh dear. <laughs> For me, the, the Brownies Ballet is the cultural highlight of the weekend. It tells the story of the day in the life of a mayfly and the problems it faces vis-a-vis -vis Brother Trout, whose sole interest is eating it. It's a specially commissioned piece for the festival, the score by Michael Barclay. Andrew Logan has designed the set and turned the school hall in, into a river, and Lynn Seymour has choreographed it for the first Wallop Brownie troupe. Uh, to have these little brownies hopping in and out of plastic bags all week. The brownies are the stars of the piece, but they are assisted by the chorus of waves led by Wayne Sleep. And I think Jenny Agata's in there somewhere too.
clear over just a bit. Okay, thank you. He is already on the radio. So no stand mic. The major will be on a radio. Lovely. Right, so we've had the intro, we've had the applause, you bring the chairs on and away you go. Uh, hello, good evening, and welcome to the third in our series, Shakespeare Masterclass. Uh, last week, remember, we were working on the body. Well, tonight it's the turn of the voice, and we'll be doing some vocal work. And for that reason, we're very lucky to have us in the studio this evening. Hugh, hello, Hugh. Hi, I'm personally uh, three people there. Three, you three made it curious to know how Mel and I met. Yeah, I'm pretty curious about that. It was a rather blurred evening, wasn't it? <laughs> it was a um, <laughs> Yes. I was in a little bar in Leipzig where I like to hang out. And, to be quite frank, I was looking for a woman. <laughs> what? For a man. Oh, I'm looking for a man, yes. I must have been a lot sex I Right, why am I an unwind the five case situation? We won't go down to the fellow spot, Graham. It's good. It's a great place. I've always loved this kind of England. Yeah. It's all treesy and thatched houses and wee woody bits and all that. It's brilliant. I love it. Yes, it is a large marquee, uh, but it has solved all these clashes in the programme that we're having, because now we've got all the village in there, we've got all the artists. Uh, last night we had everyone wanting to see the show from the pub, so now we've got the pub in there as well. you like that, I wouldn't. I can't lay uh, We've also got the festival chairman, Major Billy Jepson Turner, in there, rehearsing for his first performance as Master of Ceremonies in the Variety Night. extraordinary man. This well, uh, I wait to see. What about the locals? You can, wanna... can you read this? Julia's just done this. Everybody's in there now, so that is the festival. This is very exciting. So off you go. Lots of exciting work. Time now, gathering from the buttocks. Let's see the rest of the speech. Let's see how it works. 
time hath my lord a wallet at his back when he puts arms for oblivion a great sized monster of ingratitude <laughs> well as you can see there's still a long way to go isn't there here from my point of view this festival has been a disaster because i didn't see anything at edinburgh and i haven't seen anything at nether wallop either i am probably the only person who has seen less than the field walk Watch it, mate. You look like you could do with a pint of new tenants pills in a lago. Charmaine, do the necessary. TP tartin tin esperan. Do what? He says it's got a very different and satisfying taste. Isn't that right, mate? <laughs> new tenants pills in a lago. It's the taste that's making history. Do you know me? I created the Muppets. Big deal! Oh, wow. Everybody knows them, but not me. So when I travel, I carry the American Express card. It's backed by over a thousand travel service offices around the world, and each one is like a home away from home, except the Muppets aren't there. Hey, wait a minute, Bob! Where are you going? To apply for a card, look for this display wherever the card is welcomed. The American Express card. Don't leave home without it! It's happening at Texas New Year's Day. Over two million pounds of quality paint and quality wall coverings heavily reduced. Miles of tiles up to 40% off. Huge savings on bathrooms, bedrooms and kitchens. Thousands of DIY bargains. See you at the Great Texas Sale New Year's Day. It's magic. Ask 30 washing machine manufacturers which machine they'd recommend and you'll get 30 answers. But ask about a powder, and there's only one they all approve. New System Purcell Automatic. Its unique new system, which includes a biological action, performs superbly across the wash. But at lower temperatures, it gives you results no other powder can beat. Plus Purcell Care for your clothes and your machine. That's why for all these manufacturers, New System Purcell Automatic is an automatic choice. I'm her, her harmony Do you dream in colour? What colours do you dream? I shade and I fade, I shine and I shade Colours you dream of, one to fifteen I'm her, her harmony Conditioning colours All right, all right, I'll tell them right away. Got some wonderful news for Midland personal account customers. It's free banking. Yes, as long as you stay in credit, you get free checks, free statements, free auto bank withdrawals, and free standing orders. You don't have to pay a penny for any of them. Way! Uh, <laughs> so if you're not getting all these free from your bank, you know what to do. Talk to the Midland. They don't call us the listening bank for nothing. In 1984, the Austin Montego was the first car ever to be selected for the design center. Come and test drive the stylish 1985 Montegos. Austin Montego. Driving at its best. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a wonderful evening. <laughs> Here at the first Nether Wallop International Arts Festival, we're very honored to have with us the distinguished Shakespearean director, Stephen Fry, and fresh from his triumphant bottom in <laughs> the dream at Stratford, the actor Hugh Laurie.
Hello, good evening and welcome to the third in our series, Shakespeare Masterclass, An Actor Prepares. Last week, if you remember, we were concentrating largely on the body. Well, tonight it's the turn of the voice and we'll be doing some vocal work. And for that reason, we're very lucky to have with us in the studio this evening, the fine actor, Hugh Laurie. Hello, Hugh. Hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> Hugh, have you prepared something for us this evening? Uh, yes, I have. It's a speech from Troilus and Cressida, 3-3. It's the Ulysses speech. That's the Ulysses speech, TNC 3-3. That's on page 39 in your new Penguins, if you'd like to follow here <laughs> in the tent. Hugh, first of all, before we start, what I'd like you to do is... I want you to imagine, Hugh, that you're like a racing car going round a track, all right? Now, there's a video camera mounted on top of you, so we're all going to get a view of the track, and later on, of course, I'll be taking your engine apart, piece by piece, oiling it, putting it back together again. But, Hugh, before I strip you down and oil you, Hugh, what I want you to do is give us all a good view of that track, all right? You mean read it? Yes, read the speech right. if you want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hugh? Yes? Why are you squatting? Oh, sorry. I don't think want... we're ready for that yet, are we? No. <laughs> 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 Time hath, my lord, a wallet at his back, wherein he puts arms for oblivion, a great-sized monster of ingratitude. Well, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of work to be done, isn't there? Yes. <laughs> all right. Um, shall we start, Hugh, by having a close look at the text, all right? Yes, well, I've, I've got this raging debate within me, and the debate seems to centre upon uh, women seen both as victims and as power brokers. Yes, C can we shelve that raging debate, Hugh? <laughs> Well, we may come back to it later, but for the moment, let's put the raging debate to one side, because we've got a lot of work to do. And I want to concentrate, Hugh, on the text. What's the word, Hugh? What's the word, I wonder, that Shakespeare decides to begin his sentence with here? Uh, time. Time. <laughs> yes. Time. Yes. And how, I wonder, does Hugh decide to spell that word? Does Shakespeare decide to spell it in an unusual way? What's the way Shakespeare decides to spell it? T-I-M-E. T-I-M-E. <laughs> M-E. Yes. And what kind of spelling of the word time is that, Hugh? Yeah? <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's the ordinary spelling. It's the ordinary spelling, isn't it? It's the conventional spelling. Right. Right, so why, out of all the spellings he could have chosen, <laughs> did Shakespeare choose that one, do you think? Uh, to, well... To give us time in an ordinary sense. Because he wanted to give us time in an ordinary, right. in a conventional sense. So, right. Shakespeare has given us time in a conventional sense. Okay. All right, but he's given us something else, hasn't he, Hugh? <laughs> <laughs> Have a look at the typography. What do you see? Oh, uh, it's got a capital T. Shakespeare's T very much uppercase there, isn't it, right. Hugh? All right. <laughs> Why? Because it's the first word in the sentence. <laughs> well, I... I think that's partly it, Hugh, but I think there's another reason, too. Think. When do we spell words with capital letters? Oh, uh, well, if, if they're important... When they're important, or... when they've got an abstract sense, what I like to call an abstract conceptual sense. So, right. Shakespeare has given us time in a conventional sense, and he's given us time in an abstract sense. That's All right? right? Think your voice is ready to convey that, Hugh? I hope so. I hope so, too. <laughs> All right. Give it a go, give it a go. Just the, uh, just the one word. Just the one word for the moment, Hugh, right. if you would, please. Oh, whoa, 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 Hugh, Hugh, Hugh. Hugh. <laughs> Where do we gather from? Oh, the buttocks. Always gather Sorry. from the buttocks, yes. Hugh. Sorry. All right. <laughs> so, gathering from the buttocks. <laughs> Time! <laughs> what went wrong there, Hugh? <laughs> I don't know, I, uh, I got a bit lost in the middle, I think. All right. <laughs> Not to worry, not to worry, because what I want you to do now, Hugh, is I want you to take the word time uh -huh. and I want you to start adding some of your own feelings, all right? right? Some of your feelings of ruin and folly and hopelessness and despair, feelings too of triumph, feelings of hope, feelings of love, feelings, a sense of Troy falling and a sense of hope of Troy rising, all right? <laughs> feelings of jealousy, envy and covetousness. <laughs> ambition? No, leave ambition out. <laughs> So, gathering from the buttocks, off you go. It's time! Much, much better, Hugh. <laughs> we made tremendous strides. This is very exciting work. I'm very excited. I hope you're excited too. Oh, I am. You are excited, Hugh. Good. And I hope everybody else is excited because this is about the most exciting work I've ever done, Hugh. All right. So now let's consolidate on it. All right. Let's build. And I want you now to read the whole speech using what we've learned. What? Gathering okay. from the buttocks. All right. Time! 
half my lord a wallet at his back. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. David Lindsay with his old farmer's song. Most of you will know Dr. David Lindsay, but I suspect that some of the audience may be even better known to him. <laughs> Was an old farmer, he had an old sow. And that's the leader. Susan is a funny cool sow. And that's the leader. Susan is a funny cool sow. Sing classical rings, Rallo. Susan is a funny cool sow. Now, this old sow, she had little pigs. <laughs> Susan is a funny cool sound. <laughs> Susan is a funny cool sound. Sing classical rings, Rallo. Susan is a funny cool sound. Now these little pigs, they made a bit of bacon. <laughs> Susan is a funny cool sound. <laughs> Susan is a funny cool sound. Sing classical rings, Rallo. Suzanne is a funny cool sow. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'd like, to, if I may, to remind you of the very serious nature of our activities this weekend. Although you've all been enjoying yourself, we're doing it to raise money for two very worthy causes. One of which, as you know, is to repair the church steeple. But the rest of the money that we're collecting this weekend goes to another very worthy charity of which you've probably not heard. It's a women's London action group, and as Ken Livingstone and the GLC will shortly be abolished, there's no doubt that they will be in need of funds very soon. We're very lucky tonight to have two representatives of that society here. They would like me to make it clear to you that they are in fact lesbians, and they're going to tell us something about their work something about the way they're going to spend the money that we're collecting, <laughs> who they are to represent of that society, the Women's Voluntary Royal Lesbians Against Hitler. Good evening. Good evening. And uh, firstly, thanks very much for the money. Oh, coming. Yeah, really useful. Yeah. Um, Mel and I, oh, by the way, I should introduce myself. My name is uh, uh, Peter. Well, Peter, 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 Peter. Uh, Mel and I are part of a tightly knit cabal of lesbians. Raving. <laughs> raving lesbians. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm a bit more modest than him. But, uh, I'm a raving lesbian. Um, Amongst uh, what the figures today, we have um, there are thousands of us. Bishop of Durham, uh, <laughs> Oliver Reed, Oliver Reed, yeah, <laughs> right, Leslie is, yeah. uh, <laughs> and of course the the well-known business tycoon, Mr. Tiny. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, when you think of great lesbians of the past. People like uh, Joseph Stalin, uh, Tom Mix, and uh, more latterly, I suppose, Noel Edmonds. Noel Edmonds. <laughs> we are aware of the problems that these these guys faced. Or these gals. Or these gals. Well, these faced. gals faced. You see, with the social climate they were living in, they were unable. Shocking. They were unable to express themselves. They were, in fact, afraid to come out. And terrified to go in, really, weren't they? <laughs> We, we, and we must make this clear, we are not ashamed. Some of you may be wondering how Mel and I first met. I'm, I'm pretty curious about that as well. <laughs> it was one of those rather blurry evenings, wasn't it? <laughs> no, it was a, a little bar in Leipzig where I used to hang out, and uh, <laughs> frankly, 
I was looking for, for a man. Then Mel swaggered in, and I suddenly knew what I really wanted out of life. <laughs> a woman who could pack a punch, a woman who could wear a suit, and a woman who could stop a car with her bare hand. Well, come on, it's not that difficult to hail a cab, for Christ's sake. <laughs> we are women. Women? Big women. Big British women. Big lesbian women who happen to share a taste for oh. young, attractively sort of formed young women. Yeah. <laughs> that type of thing. And as women, as women, we understand their needs. That's right. We understand their pleasure centres. That's right. I mean, you won't find Mel and me grappling around hopelessly for hours on end. Rummaging looking, around. Rummaging around, looking all over the place as it moved, you know, yeah. we know where it is. <laughs> rummaging around for their pleasure centres? No. no. no pleasure centres are no, no mystery to us. Indeed not. In fact, we're going to open one of our own at Brent Cross. <laughs> <laughs> This is quite a nice location, a nice actually. Location. And we're hoping, obviously, a lot of men are going to come into our pleasure centre. Because... And open their minds. Exactly. Because I want to make this clear as well. We do not hate men. No. We do not hate men. We feel sorry for them. We pity them. We pity them. I mean, all that beer swilling oh. camaraderie. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> a little bit earlier on, we were in the pub, right? And <laughs> yeah. it was teeming. I mean, oh, teeming. Oh. Boozing, oh. You know, oh. arm wrestling, oh. Bar billiard, bar billiard, bar play, billiard dancing, boat, yeah. uh, yeah. hooligans, you know. Yeah. And frankly, uh, it was. Uh... It was quite nice, wasn't it? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, disgusting, yeah. It's disgusting. Uh, is just, what I meant. Well, that's right. And just thank God, thank God that we, we were able to turn to each other for sucker. For for sucker. For, for sucker. We can always <laughs> turn to each other. That's right. You're always dropping around for a little late sucker. For you? that, yeah. <laughs> you see. We enjoy the simple things in life. Yeah, we, we like simple things like nature. Country rambles. Synchronised swimming. <laughs> anyway. I want to say something, actually, about synchronised swimming. S say it. it right away. It's, it really... It has to be said. It's not as easy. Or as sensible. As it looks. <laughs> I mean, to start, you have to start, you have to be able to hold your breath for over two minutes. And, in fact, I mean, holding your breath, not breathing for over two minutes, is one of the most important things we lesbians have to learn. <laughs> well, it's, uh, the only important well, thing yeah. we <laughs> actually have to learn. That's right, yeah. But I think, uh, I think what we'd like to do now yeah. is a little piece of our forthcoming act of, right. of synchronised <laughs> swimming. We're not actually going to dive into these mugs because uh, we're not fully insured. <laughs> Anyway. OK, so here we go. Um, we're going to do a little bit from our um, new upcoming routine. Yeah. The music we'll be uh, performing too is uh, Salute to Lesbos. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a beautiful piece penned by that raving old lesbian Dick Van Dyke. Oh, <laughs> God bless you. Uh, OK, so goggles on. Goggles on. And, oh, uh, God. Judges don't actually see. 
Ramonelle, Tika, Tika, la bellezza in fiora, e la fuggevo, fuggevo, l'ora si ne bria voluta. Viviamo nei dolci fremiti, mi viene suscita e amore, spaghetti nei dolci fremiti, che suscita l'amore. Perché la glocchia al cuore ogni ora, le fracchie più che ho già fatto. shows you never can tell. <laughs> I'm now delighted to introduce Bill Wyman and Stanley Unwin in a skit of Bill leaving his job for a very risky rock and roll group. Mr. Wymold. Uh, Wyman. Uh, Wyman, sure. Uh, did you see the notice? Uh, smoking, no smoking in the office sword? Uh, no, I didn't notice. Oh, well, put it, please put it out and choke it, uh, stuff her. Oh, all right. You see, there's enough pollution as far as the acid rain, all dribbly dribbly, and all this and that, smoking, choking down the throat as the peep load. As far as the peep load here, and shot in their larynx in the throat because the uh, pard load. Oh, <laughs> Oh, Reap okay, I forgot. You know. Now, uh, would you like to take a place and sit on a bottle on that? Would well, you all? <laughs> <laughs> now, um, first of all, I, uh, you're the diesel uh, store which part makes supplied in the Wilmore lunches. <laughs> uh, the reason for calling you, Mr. Weimold, uh, is because... Weimold. Weimold, sorry. Uh, is because um, I've noticed there's uh, extra hair and dangle it and dangle it down the throat around your head bowl there. <laughs> well, very untidy corpus, for Just a little bit. I well, think. look, any good barber, 75p and trim it and trim it around the eardro. You look much smarter. <laughs> well, I, you see, I'm in... I started to play in this rock and roll band, you see, and uh, they like long hair, you know, the kids. Uh, there's a deep suffering in this. Look, are you interested in so far as the pop world it form? We formed a group and uh, we're playing, we've already played some shows in London, you know, and we've been quite successful. The what, Rolly Stokers? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Look, why do you want to join it up? There's this Cliff Jaggery, protruding livers, <laughs> all the dancing huffalo down the stage, yeah. splitting trousy there, get the microphone, we don't be off around the leg on the row of that. <laughs> well, it's uh, very lucrative. Ah, the money bag called the flesh pocker. Well, <laughs> Oh, you seek it travel abroad and flesh pockers. Which country you mowed? Well, we have we've been invited to go to America. America? Oh, what? Las Vegas? 
Yes. All these yes. are deep folly. Yes. What and about uh, the others? Germany. Germany. Ah, now watch your eat band the Munich and the Salathorcus. That's where the Beatles did their first Thorcus Modi. I think so. Ah, <laughs> I think that's you, where they were. Uh... <laughs> and uh, Holland. Can't I tempt you with the raise you have your salary for through and seps? <laughs> Did I do that? You could if I knew what you were talking about. <laughs> I think your mind is set for your guitar and plucky, Romy Broth, the Americold, and US Acres, and Australia Hood, and all these. Is it made up? Yes, I think so. Well, all I can say is deep folly and no stable load and staying in this country and seek the stability of the sensi bold and the credit bold and the great I load of this and bugger off. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Tony Pierce with a yokel monologue. Hello. You ever seen that young lady from Chipperfields? My know you and old Charlie and I you went down to Zuckers one day, you know? They had these your side shows in there, see? One of them were, were these your Tom Bowler. Old Charlie and I to go in and have a look round, you know? He said, come on, George. He said, let's go and have a go at that. So we must do go, no? Darn know if old Charlie didn't win the first prize, no? And that were one of these here toilet brushes. Two or three days later, I said, old Charlie, I said, you're, I said, who is getting on with that toilet brush? Oh, he said, I don't like it. I give it up and gone back a paper. <laughs> He went to the doctor the other day. He said, no, he said, doc, he said, give us a quick look over. He said, I ain't feeling too good. So the doctor examined on and look. He said, well, I can't find anything wrong with you, he said. He said, there's only one thing. He said, best regular. Ah, regular, ah, he said, seven o'clock every morning. So he said, what's the trouble then? He said, I don't get up for half past. <laughs> Anyway, look, i got to be off now, but before I go, I'd like to leave you with this little thought. If one storm to start, for another one to finish, you can reckon on I'm a wet day. ta da good night, God bless. And now, ladies and gentlemen, John Otway. Well, the old hometown, it looks the same as I step down from the train. <laughs> and there to greet me is my mama and my papa. <laughs> yes, they've all come to see me by the shade of that old oak tree. And it was a good to touch the green, green grass of home. Cause they've all come to see me down by the reaching, smiling sweetly, yeah, as they lay me beneath the green, green grass of home. Yes, they've all come to see me on a reaching, smiling sweetly, yeah, as they lay me beneath the green, green grass of home. <laughs> yes, they've all come to see me on the reaching, smiling sweetly, yeah, as they lay me Neath the green, green grass of home.
Was anyone at the football match in Middle Wallop this afternoon? Yay! I'm the manager of the Middle Wallop team. I was just wondering if anyone had seen the game at all. I can see a few members of my team in the audience tonight. I hope you're having a good laugh. <laughs> <laughs> but apart from them, did anyone else see the game at all? Because, um... Well, you didn't miss much. <laughs> In fact, it was pathetic! <laughs> you incompetent lord of useless bastards! <laughs> I'll hear your excuses later. <laughs> Anyone notice the final score? Bearstow, you're a chartered accountant. <laughs> you're used to dealing with big figures. <laughs> no, it was 17 nil, Bearstow, to them. No, it was to the Bearstow, it was Bearstow, Bear it was Bearstow, look, I explained this to you last week. When the ball goes in our net, it's not our score. It's theirs. <laughs> it's their score. We're, we've got to get the ball down their end. No, you didn't score one, Kerrigan. That was a pigeon you headed into the net. <laughs> <laughs> 17 bleeding bullet and nil. <laughs> well, I look, I'm stuck at a Sunday morning league. <laughs> As manager of the team, it would be totally unfair, not to say unethical, of me as manager to single out any one person for criticism, but Duckworth, you were crap. Complete <laughs> <laughs> and utter garbage. And I'm going to tell you something that may shock you, Duckworth. The only reason you're in this team is because it's your ball. <laughs> <laughs> and you touched that ball once this afternoon, Duckworth. And that was when you threatened to take it home if we didn't let you take a free kick. <laughs> and you might listen, Sourbottom. Hello, Sourbottom. Hello, I'm over here. That was Sourbottom. How many times have I told you to stay out of their penalty area when they're on the attack? I don't care, Sourbottom. You're supposed to be our goalkeeper. Stay out of their area. <laughs> goalkeeper. Goalkeeper. <laughs> You even dropped your bit of orange at half time. <laughs> and now, let's shake some action and boogie. <laughs> We're rock and roll extravaganza. Starring that Emperor of the Ivories, Mr. Jules Holland, and his celebs. Hot diggity! <laughs> Wallop, but I've brought my, my big band will be with me in just one moment. Before then, I'm briefly going to give you a little bit of New Orleans piano because I heard that's what you wanted here. Thanks. Now, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I'd now like to give you the famous, fabulous, I think they're going to fit in, they finished cheering up, the Jules Holland Big Band! <laughs> big band taken away. We have the famous Jules Holland string section going to come up now. You've seen him perform with other bands, and now you're going to see him with this one. Where is he? He's on a lot of the big people records you all remember from the 1950s. And also, we've got Mr. Rock and Roll himself, a man so great that he still seems to come here. There are none greater, surely, ladies and gentlemen, than Mr. Richie Smelly Pants Mayor. <laughs> For trouble, you've come to the right place. If you're looking for trouble, just look right in my face. I was born standing up and talking back. My daddy was a piece of real good track because I'm evil. My middle name is Misery. Yet I am evil. So don't you mess around with me. I don't wipe my bottom. And I pick my nose too. There's no stopping me. I'm bloody mad. I smoke marijuana and I don't go to lectures because I'm evil. My middle name is Jeremy. If I'm evil, so don't you mess around with me. Mess around, everybody. Ah! 
it with my mum when she gets on my wick. And when I'm tailed off, I'm deliberately sick. So look at these squares. I'm an angry young man. I once showed my willy to Now, ladies and gentlemen, the most extraordinary man in the history of the entire universe, <laughs> Billy Connolly. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Nether Wallop. Nether wallop. It sounds like something Harry Carpenter would say, isn't it? He packs a lovely nether wallop. <laughs> Which, and I must say, of all the introductions I've ever had, that's definitely the most recent. And the... <laughs> Do you know what I love? Wallop nursing home. <laughs> I know you don't find wallop very funny, but when you come across it at first, it's a, to, to the wallops, you say, what's going to happen around this bloody bin? <laughs> But Wallop Nursing Home, they're the kind that are exposed in the news of the world, aren't they? <laughs> Damn, you bastard! Hold on! <laughs> you see, I've been warned. The worst thing in the world you can do to me is warn me. Because <laughs> I, I just, I just turn the other way. It's, well, not, you know, in a biblical sense. I, I kind of... <laughs> No, but, you know, when I'm wanting to... See, swearing, I've got a reputation for bad language. Gutter language. Swearing. The F word. Fuck. Stuff like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know. But, you see, there are times... You just have to do it occasionally, because there are times when go away isn't enough. <laughs> if somebody's stroking your ass in the subway... <laughs> You know, we're so crowded and somebody's giving it a strokey wokey <laughs> and licking the back of your neck. <laughs> You've got two choices. You can turn around and say, look, excuse me, I hate to disturb you in the middle of what's very obviously your hobby. <laughs> but if you can see your way clear to stop that, I'd be delirious with joy. <laughs> or you can say, fuck off or I'll break your neck. <laughs> I would take bets as to the outcome. <laughs> but it really is awful nice to be in Nether Water. I used to live in the country myself, and there's a thing that's always dazzled me about the countryside. There's animals everywhere, and there's no dog shit in the pavement. <laughs> Isn't that extraordinary? In London, there's no animals. You can hardly bloody walk. <laughs> I think that people come out at night and shit all over the place <laughs> to pretend they can afford a dog. <laughs> Big one. But it's, uh, no, I, I, was, I meant it when I said it's nice to be here. I love being in a tent. <laughs> <laughs> I love camping and all. <laughs> what the hell are we doing in Nether Wall? <laughs> I've played some toilets in my life. <laughs> I love it. But I'll tell you something I noticed here today on the way to, to Nether Wallop. I was just, just in case I keep forgetting where I bloody are. <laughs> <laughs> but the way, you know, the hitch, I used to hitchhike a lot. You know, Jordan the hippie, yeah. Windswept and interesting, yeah. <laughs> Suitcase and guitar in hand. Ooh. <laughs> and, you know, trying to be all magic and Jack Kerouac on the road, man. And I used to kind of tidy myself up, you know, to, to try and get a lift. You know, I'd wear a woolly hat, put on my hair in it and wash myself and stuff and smile and all that. This, hitchhikers recently are getting quite extraordinary. I was looking at them at Hammersmith when we turned to come here. God, there was purple hair and... There 
a guy naked with a chainsaw. <laughs> It said, I want to eat your children. <laughs> <laughs> you see, countryside always looks terribly cosy to me. The children are all healthy. Wellies and rose. Everybody looks like apples. Hello. <laughs> Hello, I'm an apple, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> like youth hostlers, you know. Hello, I'm a youth hostler. Where are you going? <laughs> I'll kill you! <laughs> well, as I was saying, I am not a country person, but I used to go to youth hostels and all these nice people with shiny faces and an anorak. I say, hello, my philosophy is a stranger's just a friend I don't know yet. Fuck off! Oh. <laughs> You see, I had a city upbringing in Glasgow. You may have heard of it. It's a wee fishing village in the Clyde. <laughs> <laughs> and it was different from country folk because country folk wear wellies and all that, and anoraks, and they're sort of... The, the, the rain wear in the country is proper. You know, they sort of enjoy the rain and get in about it. But in Glasgow, it, it wasn't like that. I used to wear a tweed coat. This coat thought I was edible. <laughs> You know those hairy coats that eat your mouth? <laughs> there it was. You can't... And they used to send me out to play. Well, you can't play in a tweed coat. You can watch other people playing. <laughs> it's like a bloody woolly suit of armour, isn't it? And, and they used to put on a scarf on me, a big yellow scarf, crossed over at the front and tied behind me. <laughs> it's like a wally suit, you know? <laughs> and gloves that were tied with a piece of string. <laughs> Which was always too short, it was like that. <laughs> so now have you seen Charlie Harris in eyes away over that way? <laughs> My granny thought I was deformed. <laughs> Give your granny a cuddle. <laughs> See, my mother used to take me shopping like that. All that woolly gear on, and a sort of a leatherette pilot's helmet. <laughs> Do you remember them? This vinyl hat. <laughs> it made my ears all sweaty, it made my hair wet. I'm glad you're back! So, look at this. Shit! This vinyl hat, which I threw away at every opportunity, but it used to come back, cos my name and address was inside it. <laughs> I couldn't read, I was none the wiser. I thought it was a sort of design. <laughs> People kept bringing it back. Hello, Mrs. Connolly, I found your boy's hat. We were on holiday in Zimbabwe. <laughs> <laughs> but he used to take me shopping like that, with all that gear on. Said, well, in the winter it was like that, because I had the gloves on. My mother would get my hand like that and we'd get way downtown and I'd stand there. Well, she met a friend and they would talk for hours, you know. myself. <laughs> going, oh God, the kids are laughing. <laughs> what will become of the children? Oh God, how I regret that night of shame at the Conley concert. They'll be delinquent drug addicts. So... <laughs> but you know, when I was there with my mother all those years, I, 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 I became perverted. <laughs> I became totally perverse. Because I would need to pee. Because it was come such a long time. You just be nice on you go. <laughs> 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 
and we filmed you when you were in there. We were watching you. <laughs> we saw your bum. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, all together, could you point at this young girl and go, eh, 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 eh. <laughs> Was, and I would burst, you know, she, what's wrong with you? She'd be talking about operations to somebody. Yes, they took the whole thing away. It was... <laughs> hey, John, for God's sake! <laughs> They're obsessed with operations. And they do a funny mime. If it's anything below the waist, they start to mime. Yes, can I... So they're like these people who write to the papers. Dear doctor, do you ever read that stuff? I have a huge black lump under my arm. <laughs> Why are they writing to the papers? <laughs> you would dial in 999. <laughs> it changes colour at night. <laughs> my willy glows in the dark. <laughs> I bet you're glad you came, that poor woman's squirming. So, <laughs> where was I? Aye. So when I need to pee, it's just a minute, eyes until I get this idiot to... What's wrong? I need to pee. Come on. Over to the side of the pavement. <laughs> Clothes rent asunder. <laughs> Tweed coat, scarf, the whole number. Whoosh. Trousers down. <laughs> Willie out. Come on, come on. <laughs> in Glasgow. The whole world's going past on buses. <laughs> Salvation Army. <laughs> 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 it was worse for girls. <laughs> they put their knickers down and held them up like this over a <laughs> <laughs> when I was down there, as a wee person, I learned a great deal about dogs, mainly. <laughs> See, when you're only a wee person, an Alsatian's like a bloody grizzly bear. <laughs> Huge! And their breath is awful. <laughs> they breathe in wee people. <laughs> Do they like each other's asses, don't they? <laughs> all over children. And they, when they're old, they fart. <laughs> and children! <laughs> oh! Come <laughs> on! Oh, Jesus! My eyes are burning here! <laughs> and they bump into you and make your toffee apple all hairy. <laughs> to pee on me. <laughs> That's what I thought the vinyl hat was for. <laughs> obvious thing that we always end should end with like they do the last night of the prom so will you all stand and sing old lang syne <laughs> Thank you.